um, economies and laid bare the inequalities that exist within cities and society. And while the risk of the virus might be uh, universal, its impact is not. In fact, it's been concentrated on cities. And within cities, you know, uh, informal settlements, slums, uh, places that have an uh, infrastructure uh, that is uh, not doing well are particularly at a high risk uh, because of poor housing conditions, overcrowding, lack of public space, poor access to water and sanitation, and the lack of safety nets. So in places such as this, social distancing is unfeasible and there is overcrowding and people cannot simply afford to stay at home. And vulnerable groups are disproportionately affected. So informal workers, women, girls, elderly people, people with disabilities, migrants, and disabled population. And then when you take these factors of exclusion and you combine them together through the intersectionality of these dimensions, there is a risk of deepening poverty and vulnerability, which means not surprisingly that you know, an inclusive recovery is at the center going forward. So, I mean, with, with such a great panel, you know, it really is, a pleasure for us to be able to dig deeper into some of these issues and to get the, uh, their insights. So let me start with uh, Penny. So Penny, um, in, in the US, I mean, there's now a general consensus that you know, African-Americans, Native Americans, Hispanics are suffering disproportionately in the face of COVID-19 because of disparities in housing and education, access to healthcare, this brutality. We've seen really a powerful movement rising in the US requesting a racial justice and a more equitable society. So in your city, in New York City, how have you seen these racial disparities and the impact of COVID-19 play out in the city across the different neighborhoods? Pen, please. First of all, Sami, thank you so much for inviting me to join this um, fantastic panel. It's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Um, yeah, so you know, we're about a year from um, when New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic, we had days where we had up to 5,000 positive test cases um, and over 800 New Yorkers dying a day. So we um, we know that the pandemic really exposed longstanding inequities in healthcare, education, housing, and socioeconomic status. Um, but we saw what happened with our uh, our Black and Latinx New Yorkers. They were dying at twice nearly twice that of white and our Asian New Yorkers. Um, we were seeing, we're now seeing um, similar inequities in vaccine distribution. Um, for the first two weeks of the vaccine distribution in during phase 1A, about 5% of those vaccinated are identified as Latino, Hispanic, and Black African American. But th those two groups respectively make up 29 and 24% of the city's population. So white people are receiving uh, the vaccine at five times the rate while making up 42% of our overall New York City population. And so this, is, um, this disparity is something that the de Blasio administration has been working to address well before uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit us. We launched uh, pre-kindergarten um, for your international viewers. This is early childhood education for the four-year-old um, age group. Um, but we launched the first in the country here in New York City so that all children could get um, a high quality education regardless of their zip code. We, la we launched the nation's most ambitious affordable housing plan. We invested in our public schools. And so we just knew we were doing the work before um, and then COVID-19 hit. And so we created a series of task force for reopening and one of them is focused on racial inclusion and equity. Um, it is comprised of leaders of color from around the city to ensure that our COVID response and recovery is really addressing um, our hardest hit communities, specifically our communities of color. So a couple of the ways that we're doing this is we are tackling um, inequities in housing, food access, mental health, small business services, um, with some initiatives, including uh, we have a COVID-19 Centers for Excellence, um, which is to increase primary care in Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. We're launching the Landlord-Tenant Mediation Project to keep people in their homes. Um, I think everyone on this panel knows that COVID-19 has made us all focus on the basics, right? Ensuring that people are have access to safety, um, have access to a roof over their heads, uh, food security, 
community, um, we are also expanding mental health support for students in some of the hardest hit neighborhoods. And I think, you know, what in, in the American context, what people didn't appreciate were what essential workers ended up being. And those were those that are, um, you know, working in our hospitals, not just the doctors and nurses, but the janitors and the receptionists, those in our, um, in our grocery stores selling us food. And so this focus, um, not only in when we launched our test and trace program, but now in our vaccination program is really focused on how we're getting um, those that are most underserved. And part of this has also been how government talks to people. Um, you know, with this vaccine and this issue with um, certain communities not wanting to get vaccinated, there is a historical um, relationship between these communities and government. And there has been um, an administration in this country that had also worked for the last four years to undermine um, any real <laughs> trust in government. So now we have one of the fastest vaccine uh, approvals in, in history and we're asking um, you know, everyone to get vaccinated. And so the, the onus is really on us in terms of how we are communicating, um, creating access to these vaccines, but also combating misinformation, which I'm sure is something um, all of my colleagues on this on this panel we'll talk about. Thank you, Penny. It, uh, I mean, it really is uh, an impressive uh, list of actions that have been in place and continue uh, to accelerate. So let me turn to Manja. So Manja, as Pen Penny mentioned, I mean, you know, the, in general, the quality of the built environment of housing is also important for coping with the pandemic. Yet, uneven access to secure and decent housing is a striking feature of unequal cities. Obviously, we have about a billion persons living in slums today across the world, and these have become the COVID-19 hotspots. So Manja, can you tell us about the challenge of informal settlements uh, in, in your city, in Freetown, and how has COVID-19 shifted the city's intervention priorities in this regard? Thank you. Okay, um, thanks, Sameh. Um, just to give you some context, some free time context, we have about 435 residents living across more than 72 informal settlements within the city. So they account for about 35% of our population. So a huge percentage of our population live in informal settlements. At the onset of COVID, one of the really good things about, um, about our city is that we have a mayor that has Ebola experience. So she was able to look ahead. So even before we had our first COVID case in Freetown in Sierra Leone, we were already, we had already started to plan. We had already started distributing buckets. So there were things that we were do, doing ahead of time. But we also needed to address the immediate issue with the view of sustainability. What we didn't want to happen was we are seeing a world now where we have pandemics, we have epidemics. So these are going to become a natural occurrence. And so we need to make sure that measures that we put in place now are measures that will sustain us through the next pandemic. And we're not rushing again to begin something new when the next pandemic or epidemic hits. So our COVID response had three components. We had behavior change, you know, wash your hands, wear a mask, social distance. We also had behavior change support. Those in informal settlements don't have access to water the way other people do. Um, buying a mask means they need to spend additional money. This is a luxury. They, don't, they need to spend money on food. And social distancing, we talk about social distancing in formal settlements, it, it just doesn't exist. In fact, one of the things we talk about the most, we went into markets trying to find a way to social distance. We did all kinds of things. We brought in drones, I mean, all kinds of technology. It just doesn't work in our, in, in, in our context. So what we decided to do was we asked them, what does social distance mean to you? And for them, a lot of them said, it means keep your hands to yourself. So our own context of social distance in informal settlements is keep your hands to yourself as much as you can, provide them with water as much as you can, and provide them with masks. So we were able to provide 140,000 masks, which is about 10% of the population, the city gave away free masks to, just to encourage the habit of, um, of, of, of wearing masks. We also, the third component was um, isolation and containment, and this came from our Ebola experience. One of the things we need to be understood is that in an informal settlement, once you have a COVID case and it's something that's highly transmissible, you need to remove the, 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 the infected person out, have them in an environment where they're safe and, and, and don't have the probability of infecting others. So we also created a community care center specifically for those living in informal settlements so that even though they were asymptomatic, they could be removed and um, reduce the incidence of them infecting other people. 
one of the immediate challenges we faced at the onset of the pandemic was the lockdown concept. We had lockdowns during Ebola, but this this was a bit different. And with Ebola, there wasn't, I, like I'm saying, it's emerging, it, these emerging issues now show we need to plan for the future. Um, so in an environment where people live on less than a dollar a day, where basically you eat what you earn for that day, the concept of lockdown is really challenging. How, do, how am I going to... You're, you you went on mute, Manja. Sure, why the host? Sorry. How am I how am I going to feed someone? How does someone feed themselves if they can't earn for that day? And we're doing going on lockdowns for three four days at a time. So that became a real challenge. We were able to get some some funding initially, but we we're only able to provide feeding to about four thousand residents, as opposed to four hundred and thirty five thousand. That's under ten percent. So we knew there was an issue. So we introduced urban farming um, in the city. So we gave our residents, and we actually um, targeted female head of households, because when you talk about vulnerable, they are the most vulnerable. So we targeted female head of households where we provided them with boxes and seedlings and tools so that they can grow their own food. And what, what we saw was that it wasn't going to help with this that lockdown at that point, but it would help with future lockdowns. And what we've seen emerge as a result, we haven't had any lockdown since then, but these women are now being able to sell the food. So they eat and whatever is left over, they've been able to sell. So we've been able to create some income generating activity without even intending to. Um, and that's been really uh, been very beneficial. And we're looking now to expand so that for future pandemics, we're able to we're able to make sure that people in informal settlements are able to feed themselves because it became a real issue and a, a real concern. One of the other things we saw the lockdown are long lines. I'm not sure if any of you have been to Freetown, the informal settlements, mostly on the coastlines and in the valleys. So absolutely no pipe bond, pipe bond water. You have what community water points, few and far in between, and you had these long lines. So long lines of community people who are not supposed to be outside because it's a lockdown, but they have to be outside because they need water. Um, so they have these long lines and they have no masks on. So you're, you're exacerbating an issue um, that tells you, you need to social distance, you need to wear a mask. And we're breaking all of the, the, the COVID protocols because there's no access to water and water is critical. So you can't say, go home, I'm not gonna give you water. How do they survive? How do they cook? So um, we then decided that we were going to do water points. So we had these 10,000 liter tanks and at the height of COVID, it was during our rainy season. And so we, what we did, we, we created rainwater harvesting systems with 10,000 liter tanks. So across, I would say about 80, 80, neighbor, 80 informal settlements, we had these rainwater harvesting systems where more people now had access to water. By the end of this month, we'll have about 160 of those across communities. Um, again, showing us what are the things we need to do to make sure that we're supporting our residents, providing them with the services, but also making sure that they're long-term plans. Because usually what happens is we have bowsers that truck in water. But in a lot of these informal settlements, bowsers can't even go in because the roads are not motorable. So it's lots and lots of challenges, but again, looking at innovative ways for us to solve immediate problems, um, but also with a long-term view, which is why we brought in the, the rainwater harvesting aspect of it, because that's something that they can use for subsequent rainy seasons. And unfortunately for us this year, our rainy season ran into, I would say, December. So we were really able to make sure that there was water supplies in these, in these communities. And as we approach this next rainy season, um, they're going to be able to get more, more water supply, supply as well. So again, in, in, terms of, in terms of shifting our intervention and our priorities, in terms of shifting our intervention priorities, there were certain things we did, like new activities. We provided food to quarantine homes. Um, because as a city, the central government was providing food, but they would do like, we have these leaves, the local leaves, they would do the local leaves, they would do um, maybe oil, but there'd be no pepper, there'd be no onions, there'll be nothing, there'll be no, not, what do you cook it with, you need some kind of 
heat. So at city level, because we interact with the communities, we understood that what was being given was inadequate enough. Um, and so we stepped in to make sure that we were supplying what they really needed to cook daily meals in quarantine so that we don't have another, we don't have other issues erupting because it initially we had, we had protests from these homes, these quarantine homes, they don't have food, they don't have water, it wasn't given up on time. So we were able to address that issue by coming in with that, that community understanding. And it's because we we have a lot of connection in communities. There's lots of engagement um, in the communities. And so we understand what the needs are because we're closely engaging them at all times. So new activities, urban farming, distribution of food to, to quarantine homes, but our, our priorities really remain the same. Transform Freetown agenda, we, we are providing water for, for our citizens. We just accelerated at the pace we did it and added some new innovation. We needed to do sanitation. I mean, COVID, you need to make sure you have a clean environment. So we changed the way we did sanitation, but again, accelerated it. And it's now a new system that we've been able to, to adopt where you have young people who own these micro enterprises um, as a business. So the city now pays, in addition to going to private enterprise, private homes that pay them for services, the city also now pays them to clean about 68 major streets every day. And this came about as a result of COVID, the additional service that, um, that, that, that they provide to the city. So even though I would say we had new interventions, the core of our priorities as, as Transform Freetown, as the mayor's agenda, it stayed the same. And I think it's because we planned. When we started, Freetown, we looked ahead and we made sure that we planned. Um, and we didn't see a pandemic but we knew that there were issues that needed to be solved and services that we needed to give and these services ended up being services that were also needed um, as part of the covid response thank you manja that's comprehensive we'll, we'll thank you for covering both the infrastructure the livelihoods i want to take that thread of livelihoods and go to anuela so anuela in in tirana you know especially you know that the city and the country have seen an important you know economic transformation over these past years but how within a context of a pandemic, you know, how is it affecting, you know, informal workers and those more vulnerable persons that might have less protection, less safety nets, uh, youth employment, et cetera, and, and how are you going about? Anuela, please. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, for us in Tirana, and I think for everybody who's been working in local government, just as, as my colleague said here, uh, it's not that we found out these things now. So a lot of this, of the symptoms, a lot of the setting uh, for us who work in local government, we see it every day. We had seen it every day. What COVID did was not expose us to new problems, was making those problems visible to, the, to those who are not working in local government. So really um, having a sense of, a sense of, a reality um, to whether it is central governments, whether it is or international organizations, whether it is donors, whether it is big business, or whether it is the general knowledge of really being all in this together. Uh, it didn't really matter if you were a well-established business in Tirana or if you had were a formal or an informal uh, worker, everybody is affected. And I think this is not just for Tirana, this is basically for everybody else. So obviously in terms of economic, um, economic data, this has an effect. Uh, one of the things that made our case a little bit different was that we had just come out of two major earthquakes. Um, of uh, fall 2019. And when the pandemic hit, uh, what happened was that we were at the peak of really starting the implementation of, of a lot of reconstruction projects, which are major tickets for the economic, for the economics of the city, for the economics of the nation overall, for they have a GDP impact right away. And so what we did, other than what was said here uh, for vulnerable families, everybody was fed. If you were on social assistance or if you were an informal worker and you proved that you had no other income, um, you were given a, um, a schedule of, of um, supplies. So in a, in a regular schedule, you were provided all the necessary supplies, whether it was medicine, whether it was uh, groceries, whether it was other sanitary uh, products or any Anything else. So that was provided. And I think that was the basics that all cities did for their citizens. And, you know, this is not a major, um, a major discovery. But what was particularly important um, to have everybody keep working and to have to have this, um, this economic 
impetus keep, to keep going was not to stall the reconstruction efforts because that would mean then that you know the construction workers uh, couldn't even if they were formally employed they couldn't uh, provide for their families that meant that all of the bills and all of the expenses all the public expenditure that the, the government was doing whether it was through um, international financing or through local financing it couldn't it couldn't move on to the arteries of the economy it couldn't go to the households so I think that was the major the major uh, infrastructure project that kept everything rolling. And in addition to that, uh, because we are very agile as a nation and we are otherwise, um, otherwise known as, as the North Korea of Europe, we adapted really quickly, even in the private sector. So basically all retail um, in Tirana, as we speak, has the online buying option. What that, what that meant for informal workers was that, well, if, if they were working informally and they were uh, low skill labor, all of a sudden, there is this whole need and all demand of low skill labor that is actually employed in, in retail. Now, how that becomes efficient from now and on is another question. But if they needed, uh, if they needed immediate job, if they needed jobs right away, if they needed immediate income that was available and, and everybody was hiring at that, that kind of level. And the third thing, uh, which made us kind of like formalize um, our employment a lot more than we would have thought it would, was that um, the government issued what we call the war pay. So if you were under lockdown, you could receive um, a government subsidy of your salary as it had been declared for tax purposes. Now, for those who work informally, there, there was an interest now to basically formalize their employment. And so, and also for employers, um, there was, this wasn't in their interest because employers also got subsidies for the contributions of their employees. And that combined with all the need for uh, low skilled labor during this time basically made us um, have a lot more people registered rather than deregister from the employment uh, databases of the city. So um, all of those working together, I think they kind of like, you know, um, helped us keep our head above the water. Um, and especially for the vulnerable families, which goes without saying, um, we're being delivered food packages, we're being, being given subsidies. None of the families that were under um, vulnerable conditions had to pay for the for um, child care in our, in our kindergartens and nurseries throughout the city. They're all for free. Um, and all other city basic services, which were basically subsidized by a major taxpayer, um, by, by big taxpayers within, within the city um, a fiscal structure. But, but that said, um, it wasn't as tragic as we would have expected. And I think that for better or worse, the tragedy that preceded the pandemics kind of helped us um, have, keep strong. Uh, thank you, Anuela. I mean, keeping on that same theme of uh, workers and uh, informal workers and micro, uh, migrant workers, let me turn to Junaid. So Junaid, in, in India, I mean, obviously COVID-19 has put uh, a spotlight on migrant workers and their precarious status in, in cities. I mean, the closing of factories and, and the initial lockdowns have resulted in millions of workers being left homeless and, and countless of these, I mean, uh, by some counts, you know, several millions have returned to their hometowns, many of whom walking, in fact, for, for hundreds of miles. So in your view, Junaid, what can city governments do uh, in terms of extending social services, programs to migrant workers, uh, while strengthening overall, if you want, labor governance? Uh, so, uh, Junaid, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sami, and uh, wonderful to be part of uh, this uh, panel. Um, you know, let me answer your question first by saying I have never seen federalism so much at so, being tested so hard as I have seen it in India and then observing from so far away how federalism was being tested in the United States. It is absolutely stunning that the state structures built around constitutions did not and was not able to respond quick enough in a place like the United States to the needs of citizens. But then you come to a place like India and you see federalism of a young nation 
beginning to actually express itself. Why do I start with federalism? Because it's impossible to provide social safety nets unless the federal tier is ready to work with the third tier. If you leave it to the third tier, there is no third tier in the world that can deliver on the social protection in the type of pandemic uh, shocks that we are, we are seeing. And I have to say, this is a wake up call on climate change. Uh, if we're gonna see countries brace for change and the center and the third tier do not work together, you are going to have a serious situation. And so what, uh, what we began to see in India was a pivoting in the social protection. India is dominantly a rural-based social protection system. So you have Manrega, which guarantees work for anyone who wants to show up uh, to, uh, for work of up to 150 days. It's a very strong rural-based system. What India had to do was pivot away from a rural social safety net into a pan-India and an urban safety net. And an urban safety net meant you had to deal with informal workers. Remember, 90% of Indian workers are in the informal sector. They are not uh, uh, backed, by, uh, uh, backed by formal uh, uh, social protection. Second, uh, you, had to, uh, uh, you had to deal with uh, migrant workers. Uh, and migrant workers need, uh, need uh, social protection that's portable. So if I move from Bihar, to uh, Mumbai to work, uh, I should be able to carry my rights in terms of social protection. So informality and uh, uh, portability had to be created and created very, very quickly. But what, was, what, what, in, what India had, which enabled India to pivot uh, were the following. First, they had invested in a, uh, in a uh, identification system. So you had Aadhaar, which is a, a global ID, but you had other forms of, uh, of ID that actually uh, pinpointed who needed, needed help. Second, India had invested in direct benefit transfers, cash transfers into bank accounts. In particular, 300 women headed households have bank accounts into which cash was, uh, was transferred. Uh, and the third was we always complain about India's uh, food security, uh, uh, if you will, obsession, and therefore procurement of food and, and uh, food, uh, food banks and the, the food distribution system. Well, guess what really worked uh, in, in this pandemic was the fact that India has one of the most amazing uh, food distribution systems. So it was able to kick in on the, PD, on the PDS. And what federal government did was it actually put money into all of these areas, food security, into cash grants, into its FEMA, right? It has a FEMA, which opened the window into direct ca into cash transfers into, uh, into states. And second, was states were able to then piggyback on their social protection, uh, protection system. Now, none of this worked seamlessly, as you pointed out, Sami, uh, the real tragedy of watching uh, watching uh, migrant workers, informal workers who are not protected, uh, what, what they faced. But, it, but what I have to say, and, and coming back to what uh, uh, I think Anuela uh, mentioned, the, uh, being, the state being able to adapt. Could you adapt quickly? In the case of India, it adapted. Uh, and I think that that was, that was absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. So the takeaway for me uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the pandemic to date is you cannot take it away from a, fe uh, away from a federal system. You can't let cities by be by themselves. You have to put cities in a context of a federal system and ensure that that federal system works, uh, works correctly. And second uh, is social protection. Uh, investing in social protection is not just simply a social uh, a social uh, issue it is actually investing in your workers and in the ability of an economy to rebound after uh, after a shock. And investing in a, a national social security system, which uh, would deal with portability, informality, will deal with uh, women-headed households. Because clearly, as we have seen, one of the fault lines that has come out of uh, pandemics 
is the uh, inequitable burden that women and girls have faced uh, in, the, in the lockdown and in the tension between lives and livelihoods. Over to you, Sami. Thank you, Junaid. And, and taking that last thread of yours uh, to zoom in on gender issues and on you know, the types of issues that have emerged during the pandemic and how can we use that as an impetus to transform our cities into more inclusive. Maybe I can turn to Penny. Penny, before joining the mayor's office, you were the uh, director of Girls and Women Integration of the Clinton Global Initiative, and you worked a lot on gender issues, especially on, on women empowerment. Now, what in, in the context of the pandemic, what gender challenges have become more pronounced? What did you observe in the city and what actions did the city do uh, to, to tackle these? I think uh, to Janaid's point, it all got <laughs> emphasized. I do want to quickly address um, what he said about the, ne the necessity of having a strong federal government. We felt that um, last spring, you know, March through June, um, while New York City was the, the epicenter, we were on our own. And I think it also spoke so much, and I think in an American context, how important it was, I think, for Americans, um, and we've really seen this in climate over the last few years, but the leadership that can be, be had at the local and state level, um, I think was really an important um, awakening for Americans in terms of how much we could actually do locally. We need our federal government, but we actually got a lot done um, in its absence that I think is a good learning moment for Americans from a citizen perspective. Um, and uh, Sami, to your to your question, um, you know, and unfortunately, the first thing that we saw was a significant increase in domestic violence. Um, that I think is unsurprising. That I think was reflected around the world. Um, you know, suddenly people are home with their abusers all day, and we had we went into shelter in place um, back in mid March. Um, and so, what we had to do was try to figure out how best to pivot all of our programming online. Um, you know, we were renowned. Um, you know, I run the the International Affairs Office. We would have delegations from all over the world that would want to come during the Cannes Commission on Status of Women to visit our family justice centers, these like one-stop shops where you can, uh, survivors get everything from confidential health services to also, um, you know, economic empowerment uh, classes and other training re related to how they can sort of re-enter society. And, you know, all of that had to be taken online, which was extremely hard, but also um, very effective. Um, we were able to, um, also create through our task force on racial inclusion and equity, um, public private partnerships to provide micro grants to domestic violence survivors. So we had to get creative, I think as everybody had to, but really take it online. Um, one of the big investments of the administration too has been in our minority, um, minority and women owned business program and the way that the city is incurring, uh, procuring um, business through these, uh, through these small companies. And so what we've done is we've connected our black and Latinx entrepreneurs to business opportunities, including government contact, a contract matching and access to pro bono um, consultants. So this is just building up on what we were already doing. But again, I think um, Manja said it, all this did was accelerate what we needed to do. Um, and this investment in women and um, how we are tackling um, sort of the gender, uh, the gender gap here in the city. And of course, you know, this is something we're still working on is um, so many women had to leave the workforce. And that I think is a phenomenon, not just in New York City, but around the US and perhaps around the world. And that is something that we're still uh, very much figuring out how best, best to address. Uh, thank you, Penny. Uh, and, and maybe can we pivot uh, a little bit to uh, the issue of youth and, and um, Anuela? Um, I understand that uh, Tirana has sponsored the upgrading of kindergartens and nurseries, and the city is actually uh, developing new playgrounds, car-free zones. Can you tell us about, you know, how have you decided in terms of the, those refocusing on, on priorities and, and how, you know, to what extent is the city working uh, to make itself a better place to live for children and, and other um, such initiatives? Yes, thank you for this. It's uh, my favorite topic. And reason for that is it turns out, um, it turns out that the core of everything that doesn't work um, in our cities is lack of democratic development. 
Um, when we're thinking of cities, especially in the, in the last 50 years, and when you think of why they were developed in a certain way, you think of a, of a very precise target. You think of the working person that has to go from A to B really quickly, doesn't really have time to hang around with his kids or walk them to school because, you know, that's not very efficient. Um, doesn't really matter where they're working or how far away it is because they're going to commute. We're not really thinking about their quality of life much. You know, if, they're, if it takes them three hours to go from, from their workplace to, to their home um, and if they're happy or if they're depressed, we're not really thinking what the kids are interacting with uh, if they are being driven to school or they're taking only the bus um, and what kind of interaction do they have with the city. We're not really thinking of spending any time that is idle uh, because we think of it or we thought of it as something that is not really that efficient. And so that's not necessarily a democratic development. That's a sort of efficient development, which turns out that if you do not have democracy at the core, you don't have efficiency either. Because you know you have to pay for for workers who are depressed. You have to pay for kids who are not happy and healthy and 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 working and and playing outside. You have to pay for the fact that um, you need childcare for extended hours. You have to pay for all of that in one way or another. So all that extra money that we get doesn't really go to the people who are commuting. Doesn't really go to the kids um, who are not thriving. Doesn't really go to the woman who is handling all this stuff and maybe she cannot even afford to go to work. Um, so how are we building our cities in a democratic way? Obviously the first thing that is undemocratic about the city is to build cities for cars. And, um, and in Tirana, that's what we saw. We saw that there had been a lot of development in the last 30 years. And all of this development had been around this uh, thing that was not even a being, you know, it was this machine, uh, which we idolized so much. And it seemed like we're paving roads nonstop and we're creating new roads nonstop and we're building highways and, and we're doing all of that for what? For the car to go in a smoother way and we're bringing parking lots. And, and so we, when we came to the office, it was a little bit um, oxymoronish to think that, you know, there was no other, no investment in terms of like kindergartens and nurseries and kids and green spaces and playgrounds. And um, you might not believe this, but in a city of a million, there were zero, zero playgrounds for kids, zero public playgrounds. Um, and so to me, to, to us, uh, not just us parents, but I mean, to everybody, it was just shocking. Um, and we got in the office in July and, and school was supposed to start, well, it started in September and uh, there, you needed immediate action. And obviously, you know, no city can do it alone. Um, no matter what, what kind of budgets and what kind of liquidity you have, uh, you cannot really um, take, have an undertaking such as to undo so many stuff that has been done before in the wrong way and really do that budget planning um, so that it, it suffices everybody. So we said, you know, in a city of a million where we are actually responsible for 40% of the GDP of the whole nation, there should be 40% of solidarity. Uh, for from companies, from from people who have um, who are employed somewhere, or for those who who make business in the city, who want the city to thrive because their businesses will thrive. So we actually auctioned out um, in a very fun and and um, and social way um, these kindergartens and nurseries that needed reconstruction, immediate reconstruction to start with, and so uh, we had companies come and, and offer their services. And we just gave one kindergarten to them. It's like, this is your insurance company. You do whatever you want to do. You procure whatever you want to procure. We don't want to see any money going around. We just want to see it finished. And so it became as, as a competition in the beginning where you know uh, companies would wanted to show who did the best work out of it. But at the end, it was the kids who, who benefited from, from this service. In our public um, kindergartens and nurseries, we have this service for as young as six months uh, up till when they go to school. Um, in those, we had only 30% enrollment uh, when we got in this office because you know they were such a bad shape. And now uh, for every position there's at least 11 kids in the waiting line just because there's so much demand um, and they're so 
um, qualitative and they, they offer such a good service. So in any case, that's where we started. And then we said, you know, playgrounds are the next big thing. And um, we, had a, we had a deal in everybody in here. We said, we're, we're not going to leave this office unless we have at least one playground per month. And so in our first term, we had 48 playgrounds all spread around the city. And I like to show the map to people. I would want to show it to you because it's all equitably um, um, distributed. So it's not in certain areas. It's not in certain neighborhoods. It's everywhere. And we have this challenge with all the neighborhoods. And we tell them, if you find us a patch of land, we're going to have a kindergarten, a, a, a playground area there. Um, how we do that again was much with the CSR, um, uh, CSR money that came from companies. You want to spend it somewhere somewhere nice, just buy the equipment and we're going to put, put in all the works. And so far, I'm just happy to report I last count was 63. So in a city of a million, that's a good start from zero to 63. Um, what you do in terms of building this democracy, and I mentioned the car space before, is actually when you're planning the city, um, make sure that you plan for 80% of the people in our case that do not own cars. Um, so before we were planning for only those 20%. Buying a, a vehicle doesn't really make you more powerful than the rest of the, of the citizens. I always give people the example of my parents. They're retired. They're both in their late 70s. And, you know, why don't they occupy 20 meters square of land in a public street to build a garden? You know, because basically that's the same space a car needs to get parked in a public uh, in a public street. And so we took all these parking spaces that were um, on public streets uh, and we uh, turned them into bike lanes. And so far we have 50 kilometers of bike lanes from zero. It's just a, it's just a pop up bike lane before you know, put a barrier. So cars know they cannot park. Drivers know actually cars are fine with it. Um, and then and then you actually make all this, um, all the signal, all the signaling and all the equipment that makes it basically safe and, and the barriers uh, for, for, for the rest of the, of the infrastructure. And with all the space that we will find, uh, pedestrianizing areas that are otherwise, that were otherwise for cars, turning all of our center um, center into the large pedestrian square where no cars can access it, whereas before it was just a roundabout. All this stuff is not really just um, aesthetics. You know, it doesn't really just look good. What it does at the end is it does increase property value by, um, a lot. Uh, in some areas, we've counted 30% increase in property value in areas where we've pedestrianized uh, the streets close by. It does make up for a lot of employment opportunities because these pedestrianized areas also offer services. And the more services they offer, the more services our people are going to ask for. So you have more restaurants, more bars, more cafes. All these small shops are selling all of a sudden a lot more before everybody would just go to the mall. Now they don't have to. And they're just strolling and, you know, doing their shopping by walking. Um, and all of these things that, like I said before, uh, people who work in local government knew. I mean, this is proven all over and over and over again. Um, this is becoming obvious and it's, it works for the city. And again, if it doesn't have that democratic element of development at the bottom and doesn't necessarily serve only one type of citizen, but more and, and most, um, then it doesn't, it wouldn't hold for a long time. So that's that's in terms of planning on what we what we do, and in terms of programs, there's a lot that the city does. But really, the fundamental is um, make it work for people, not for ideas, or not for cars, or not for things that are not feeling and are not touching. Thank you, Anuela. Uh, and and staying within that same theme of. Uh, city transformation. I want to go to Freetown and then to Medellin. So uh, Manja, uh, perhaps, you know, quickly, if you can shed some light on how uh, within the Transform Freetown plan, I mean, you know, two particular initiatives, the greening of the city and the involvement of youth in the solid waste management sector, which I understand is subject of, of, a, of a grant that you've received from the Mayor's Migration Council. Manja, please. Thanks, Sameh. Um, so Transform Freetown, is, which, which is the mayor's agenda, 
um, has made significant pro progress despite the, the pandemic. Last year, we were able to work on about 55 projects in sectors ranging from urban planning to environmental management and skills development, while expanding the scope of work we do to include um, our response to COVID as well. Um, of the 55 projects we worked on last year, 21 of them, we actually only secured funding for them last year. So we built, we were able to build on existing projects um, last year. We continue to invest in um, sustainable sanitation interventions. And I'll talk about that first, um, which includes expanding one of our most successful programs. So the Transform Freetown agenda, when we came into office, um, the mayor, we had about six months of planning. We have 11 priority sectors, including um, sanitation and environmental management. With, this, it, um, with the priority sectors, we actually went to residents to say, what do you think feel about the level of service delivery you're getting from the council. Um, and it was really poor at that time. The council said, out of a range from one to 10, we were under two in terms of service delivery across all the sectors. So we were coming from a really low baseline. Um, one, of the, one of the targets that we set for sanitation was to improve solid and liquid waste management to 60% by the end of the mayor's term, which ends in 2022. We came from a baseline of 21% of solid waste was being disposed of safely and only 6% of liquid waste. So we knew we needed to have interventions that would address some of these issues. Immediately, we went to the EU and um, IOM with an idea. We went to say, a lot of homes in our city, especially as about the informal settlement, are in areas that are hard to reach. We had private sector operators, but they only had 8,000 homes. And we have over 100,000 homes in our city. So only 8,000 of them had household waste collection. We knew we needed to do something really fast. So they have these tricycles and we have tricycles and we have 10, 10 people to a tricycle. So it's a micro enterprise. They were given the tricycle and they were asked to form a cooperative and they were given training. So they were given training on business planning, on business management and also marketing. But what the council also did was to pass a resolution to say, each home needs to have a registered waste service provider. So we were able to, in addition to providing them with the tools they needed, we also created an environment that made it easier to be able to get clients for their businesses. So we've come in at in 20, uh, towards mid 2019 with 8,000 households. We're now at over 30,000 households that have waste service providers now that they're there that they pay on a regular basis but these these 80 tricycles with about 800 young people are at capacity they can no longer take on more clients and so we went to the mmc to say listen we have a model that really works um, but we need to have more funding to be able to take them on but we want to be able to do something a bit different this time. The first 80, they actually just received the tricycle and they didn't have to pay back. But this new model, they would have to pay back. So we have a sustainable system where they will buy a tricycle for another set of people. So we replicate the process and are able to really provide services to all our residents and, we're, and then we'll be able to meet, to meet our target. One of the things that we noticed immediately is that a lot of the young people, because it's young people, a lot of them are between the age of 20 to 28. And a lot of them are rural to urban migrants. We actually did a survey and found that 70% of our waste service providers within these tricycles are from, from rural areas. They came to Freetown seeking better opportunities for themselves and for their families. And um, with a lot of them uneducated, um, with no means to, to have funds to go to school, we're able to provide them with, with an economic activity that's sustainable because these are clients that they're going to, they're, they're going to have um, and even when clients drop, they have an opportunity to get new clients. So we feel that it's a sustainable model for our young people. And it also ensures that we're including them in economic activities that will be able to help them and their families. So that's something that's worked really well. And um, that we're, we're, we're hoping, we're actually hoping we're on target to, to meet our 60%, especially on the solid waste side by mid next year. So we're on target to meet the target that we've set. We also had a very ambitious plan to grow 1 million trees. Um, if Freetown, Freetown is beautiful. We have the mountains, we have the sea, but the mountains are bare. A lot of the trees have for deforestation. People are people are logging to sell. People are also logging for homes and logging for charcoal. So you look all across our city and you see these these bare mountains. I mean, we had a landslide in in, in 2017 that claimed over a thousand people within seconds. So we have real issues. We also have flooding every single year. We have flooding um, that that takes away lives, and we're able to do 
activities that solve the problem at that moment but we understand that sustainability and long term we need to make sure that we're planting trees we have flood mitigation activities again where we use young people in communities to clear drainages around rain when it, when we're approaching rainy season so they clear all of the drainages they clear all of the gutters but you find that a lot of the the a lot of the gutters are filled with silt and the reason why they're filled with silt is because of this deforestation. So when the rain comes, it just washes down silt into the into the waterway. We also have a huge importation of, of used clothing issue. Um, so we find that our waterways, our gutters are filled with silt, with used clothing, and with, with plastic. Um, all of this is coming, a lot of it coming from the hills because it's deforestation. When the water comes, there's nothing to hold it. And so what we're trying to do is to make sure that we're planting enough trees and trees that are native so that they last long, but also trees that can grow fast because we have a real issue on our hand. We've been able to plant between 2019 and 2020 and last year, we've been able to plant 350,000 trees. Um, so we are, wow. we are very short of our 1 million, but we are very, very committed to making sure that we plan the 1 million before our term is, our term is over. We're on, we're looking to now, we've have we've just secured funding to do about 50,000 in the mangroves. So we have a lot of threat in our coastal waterways as well. And Freetown, it, it's a city, but we have, it's a, it's a, it's a city on the coast. So um, our marine life, a lot of things are a threat. So we, we're also working to make sure that we address um, that, that we address these issues. But the really unique thing about our tree planting program is that we're growing trees. We're not just planting it. There are lots of, we had lots of case studies in the past where trees were planted and they didn't grow. So we have included a stewardship program and a tree tracking program into our, 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 our 1 million trees campaign where we have people in communities. So in communities, you'll see them in the morning actually taking jerry cans to water to water the trees, to, to make sure that they're growing. Um, we also have tree trackers. So each tree that was planted has been tracked and we have, a, we have a system where we're tracking them. So we're able to watch them grow. And that's how we're able to, for example, know that we have 10% about 10% of the trees haven't grown um, because we've been able to track it using, using technology. So these are some of the things that, that we're doing in terms of, um, in terms of our, tree, our tree campaign to make sure that the trees grow. We have so many tree campaigns in the city that have failed in the, um, over, over the years. I mean, we came in, people were saying they've planted a million trees before, but there's no evidence of it. But we wanted to make sure that we had evidence of that, and which is why we introduced Fantastic. new elements into our campaign. And also Chris. Thank you, Manja. This is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is an inspiring story. Santiago, Medellin, it's a story that uh, many of us working on urban have followed. It's a city that has been totally transformed from a city plagued with inequity, with violence, into an inclusive and innovative city. Uh, it's a place where urban policies and planning are used not just you know, to transform cities, but to heal communities. So can you tell us about Medellin's transformation or the Chief Resilience Officer, you've seen, you've implemented quite a bit of such transformation, be they related to transport, to public spaces, amenities, to inclusion of slum communities. Santiago, please. And I'm asking also if anybody from our audience has questions to please uh, start putting them into the chat so that we can take a couple of rounds before we conclude. Santiago. Thank you, Sami, and, and thank you everybody for, for being here with us. Uh, first of all, uh, turning crisis into opportunities uh, is, is not a simple thing, uh, and it sounds good, but, it, but it's not as simple as, as, as you think it is. First of all, you acknowledging the crisis is not enough. Uh, you need a deeper understanding, a desire for, for deeper understanding. Uh, and understanding that crises are the trigger of long-standing social phenomena. It's like in a marriage, uh, when you have small discussions, they are not about small things. They are normally and usually about bigger issues that you don't address them properly before. Uh, and for that, uh, the principles that we took here in Medellin are very simple. Uh, first of all, we apply data, evidence, and dialogue approach. Uh, normally, indicators and uh, statistics, they don't talk by themselves. You need dialogue in between to be able to read those 
to read data properly and to understand what are behind uh, the major issues. In, in our city, it was easy to, to blame violence as the, as the major issue. But when we took uh, a more integrated approach, it, it, it unveiled that inequalities, poverty, lack of access to transportation, education, and, and all the social fair system was the, the real cause of, of violence and, and social uh, disruption. Secondly, you need a strategic thinking and a strategic thinking to promote planning, urban planning and dialogue again as the first tool to invite society to participate in building the vision of that future city where we all want to be. Uh, and, and not only inviting society to participate, but to take ownership of that future vision. Cities don't build by themselves. You, it requires private, public, community, and all the possible efforts together. Third, you need a, a, a multi-dimensional uh, uh, approach. You need to think that whatever you plan, you have to plan it at the human scale. You have to plan it at the community and neighborhood level, but you also have to plan it at the city level. If you don't really integrate the, that multi-scale and multi-dimensional uh, uh, approach, things are not gonna work. Uh, and probably uh, is, uh, things like playgrounds, they, they're not gonna work because if you don't plan it at the human scale for the kids, but you don't plan it at the neighborhood scale, uh, community won't use it. And if you don't plan it in the map of the city, they probably not gonna become a network of, pla of playing grounds. And, 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 and another principle that we all know is people are at the center of everything. Cities are not roads, cities are not building or infrastructure or whatever. Cities are people, we are the cities. So whatever we do is all about bringing better quality uh, uh, services to improve quality of life for, for, for our citizens. And, and finally, one of the most interesting uh, lessons learned in Medellin is all of this has to be integrated in a, in a major plan, uh, in a long-term plan that, that really address all the issues of, of, of a city. Uh, and I'm going to give you a, a very small example of, of, of bringing a, a, an integrated approach to as, as, as a part of the, the solution. We all know about transport-oriented development and how it's important that along those transport systems, you bring a, a other type of a, a solutions and social services. But you could take the approach of, of of bringing playgrounds everywhere. But how are you going to choose when you have a, a, a limited resources? And, and don't forget, Medellin was one of the poorest cities 30 years ago. We didn't have enough resources to probably uh, unveil uh, uh, the, the approach that you were talking and well of putting and building hundreds of, of playgrounds. We have only money to, 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 to implement five or six of them. So it requires also a very uh, difficult decision-making process of where to place your limited resources. And the only way to do that is dialogue again, agreeing with your city and with your citizens uh, where should we really put our money and our efforts in, in an integrated way? So everybody agrees that probably when you have the lowest quality of life, the lowest uh, social system in place for, for the citizens, that's probably the, the, the place where you need to, to, to really put your, your human resources, your economic resources, and, and to uh, uh, develop a, a, an integrated approach. That's how 
when when we decided long ago uh, to to display the, uh, uh, what we call PUIs, the integrated urban plans, the, the city was 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 okay with that. Let's put our, our money in only one community, waiting that that strategy was going to give us the light uh, as, as, a, as a lesson learned to apply it in different other communities when we probably uh, uh, had the money. And, and, and after 30 years, uh, we learn it, we learn it. Uh, we still have, well, we, we have a, a, a strong economy in our city now, uh, but there were communities that waited 20 years for that urban plan to come. Uh, and, and that was an agreement of the city. You need, you need more than, than the just uh, resources, uh, planning, and, 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 and develop all these urban strategies and techniques, but you need dialogue at the center of, of this process. Dialogue with society, dialogue with private uh, uh, and businesses, dialogue with, with the uh, politicians, uh, with community leaders, and all of them agreeing on that vision, uh, that future vision of the city, we all want to be part of it. Sami? Yeah, go ahead, Janet. Sami, I, I, I just want to piggyback on, on what Santiago uh, just said, because it links to something that Penny at the beginning talked about, how we, how does the state talk to its people? Or Anuela's point about demo, democratic development. Um, what we have discovered is in public health, you have to trust the state. But if you're going to trust the state, the state has to engage with communities in a very different way. <laughs> and in what the pandemic has shown is that the role of local governments is now even more important because that's the interface between citizen and the state. So in a federal system, you have to leverage the cities and the local governments to reach out to your communities. So essential for public health. Because one of the big issues about public health is community surveillance. If you can have surveillance, you can tackle the, uh, the disease before it spreads too much. For that, you have to have citizens trust you that when you are asking to do uh, community surveillance, you're being asked to do it in the right way. I mean, that, I think that's a, this issue of the state being trusted and the role of local government is very important. But the second thing I, I want to stress is there's a lot of talk that what the pandemic has shown is dense areas are a danger. So are we, are we talking about the demise of cities because of, of pandemics? And I think we have to remind ourselves that there's a difference between density and overcrowdedness. So when uh, Manja talks about how the informal community was mobilized to take on the challenge of, uh, uh, of COVID, Dharavi in Mumbai, the, one of the biggest slum areas in the world, has shown zero infection. It's not the density that mattered. It was the fact that you could manage density. And to manage density, you need a, you need a city government capable of doing that, which is back to Santiago's issue of a local government and its engagement with communities and, and citizens. So I think it's very important that unless anyone in the panel believes otherwise, that we do not fall prey to any thought that the demise of cities has, has come. Cities have gone through bubonic plague, cities have gone through Spanish flu, it has gone through wars, New York has gone through 9-11, right? Cities rise because of the shocks that they, that they face. One final point, Anuela's point about fields, uh, sports areas, when we started working in Jordan with all the displaced communities coming from Syria into Jordan and settling in the, in the, in the towns, in the border towns, the mayors of the border towns asked money for what? Playgrounds. Because they said, if you don't have playgrounds where communities can come together, you're not going to be able to deal with the, with the inequities of society. You have to bring them together in a playground. So th that, that playground has a, has a very powerful symbolism of how localities work. 
Wonderful, Junaid, and I'm really glad. I mean, you've you've done my part of threading it all together and you've done it in a way that I could not have done it. So that's fantastic. So let me then use the remaining uh, few minutes to pass two questions uh, from the audience. Uh, one to Anuela on um, how the city has supported the uh, culture and creative uh, industries. And one to Penny on, you know, the momentum that the city is taking in a post pandemic to accelerating uh, some of the transformations that are underway. And specifically, I'm thinking of both public space and the affordable housing. So Anuela and then uh, Penny, and then I'll ask you for a closing statement. Um, I love the question. Uh, if you guys see behind me, um, we have it's we have every year a cloud festival, and what it is is that we, there's this big installation of Sufujimoto. He is um, a Japanese artist who had this major installation in the in the Serpentine Museum in London. And uh, we had a donor who was willing to bring it here because, you know, um, it's privately owned and it's very spacious. So, you know, they, it would actually save the money to store it somewhere else. And we said, you know, it might just be a piece of art for the city. And what it is, is just basically a, a, a super uh, beautiful space, the most Instagrammable, actually, the first year where we put it, where, and it's completely open. It looks as a cloud if you see it from uh, from far, but inside is a space for performances and a space for shows and a space for uh, exhibitions. And because we're blessed with really really good weather, it basically works ninety percent of the time. Um, but but that's just to show you how much we're committed into this, and it's one of my favorite topics because we go by the motto of you, people do not live of food alone. Um, they, you need the food for the soul and the food for the soul comes out of how vibrant your city is, how much opportunity you're giving to arts and how much you're feeding it to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're living in the slums, if you're living on low income, if you're living on the highest of the, of the, of the high rises, you still need to feed your soul. Um, and that is just something that is irreplaceable anywhere else. I mean, that's just, you cannot do anything else but, but to feed it the way you feed it through art and, and creativity. So um, we have a variety of programs, um, not just space. If you want to rent any space that is publicly owned in Tirana as we speak, and you want to have an arts function, that's going to be completely for free. So, you know, you don't need to pay anything if you want to have an exhibit, if you want to have a show, if you want to have a competition, um, anything you want to have, and it's for the city and you don't charge other people to attend, um, that's just for free, that's on us. In terms of both public space and private and, and, and indoor spaces that the city owns. Um, the second thing that we do, we have this large program where we actually subsidize a lot of projects that young people might have, whether it's concerts, whether it's, um, you know, an exhibition, any project that they have, we have a separate uh, fund every year uh, that it's, it's pretty significant for our budget. It goes up to $1 million a year. So it's not really small considering our, our uh, modest uh, budget in, in Tirana. Um, and we help people out just through that. The other way, the other thing that we do, we have, um, we have this uh, um, uh, thing that we do with high school kids. And um, when I was young and we had nothing else, um, we had this major competition where all the high schools would get together and we would have kind of like a talent show before talent shows were a thing on, on international TV. And, um, and we took that tradition because and it was the only thing we could. I mean, during communism, the only entertainment you had was to go to the centers and, you know, do a little bit of theater or, or, or learn some, some type of music because you had no TV, you had no interaction with the world. Um, nobody could go abroad or travel. So, you know, that was the only entertainment we had. So we picked up on this tradition and um, the city organizes this large scale competitions of arts and creativity uh, for kids who are 15 to 18. And so, you know, for young artists and aspiring and everything like that. So it's, um, and again, I was telling you about the cloud. Every year at the cloud, not only do we host a local artist, but we have an international um, a mod modern and, and traditional performance festival where I invite everybody who's listening to really attend and, you know, once COVID measures are down um, to have that experience. 
Wonderful. We are really looking forward, Anuela. Penny, transformation in New York City, and sure. you'll have the last word for this panel. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I, I've uh, very much enjoyed this conversation. Um, it's very similar to the conversations we're having here in New York City. And, you know, with the, the, one, um, the one program I'm going to talk about just to conclude is we saw acceleration happen because of COVID-19. We also saw innovation happen um, and to the, the conversation we had earlier um, about having at the start of the pandemic, um, a federal government that was not only disengaged, but in a, in a sense, um, a little bit of competition with what we were doing. Um, we've had to be entrepreneurial in ways uh, that I think is gonna benefit the city and the transformation. And one of them, and it's this really simple one, it's our open streets program. Um, to, to a point that everybody's been making, um, you know, cities are becoming less unfriendly to cars. Um, we are doubling down on public transportation, um, you know, uh, our city bike program, but really bringing everybody out into the streets to be able to enjoy art, enjoy food, our restaurants, um, our bar scene. And, you know, that we had to cut all kinds of red tape <laughs> over a very short period of time. And it also shows how nimble city government can be if we're forced to be. Um, and so we're really proud of a lot of the innovation that we've taken over the last um, over the last year. And I believe that this is gonna be just a trend moving forward. And the one thing that we haven't talked enough about um, in terms of this conversation and city leadership on um, equity issues as well is the role of cities and local governments in climate, um, in climate action. And I will say from an American perspective, from the New York City perspective, we have taken climate accountability very seriously. And we have um, launched our efforts into divesting our pension funds. This is our, our school teachers pension funds um, out of fossil fuel companies, because we saw the damage that happened out of Superstorm Sandy. And so we are seeing cities now put um, also our money <laughs> where, where this action needs to take place on, um, on climate. And so those are the kinds, uh, that's the kind of momentum I think um, we are gonna continue to see in the, in the coming years. And thank you again, Sami, for um, inviting us to join you today. Um, thank you very much, uh, Penny. I think we take out of, of the many ideas that you've all shared with us, you know, a great range of possibilities. I mean, you know, the critical role cities like Freetown are playing in terms of, you know, uh, greening the city, but also uh, strengthening the resilience against, you know, landslides within the city, you know, involving the youth. Anuela, you told us about Tirana and the, you know, the, you know, the, the way the cities develop playground, uh, kindergarten, um, the way it's supporting the cultural and creative industries, uh, the agility that's out there. Penny, you know, you've told us about a great range of things that New York City has done because it was the epicenter of the pandemic here in the US and it was reaching a scale, you know, of having to deal with the inequities, you know, in terms of the impact of, of the uh, pandemic and uh, the way it's responded with its, uh, you know, creating the trust, you know, working on, you know, the public space, the response, both to the pandemic, but also to the recovery. Uh, Santiago, you shared with us the story of Medellin and its transformation over decades, you know, um, Junaid, you know, you brought it all together in terms of, you know, what it means in terms of cities rising out of crises like this, as opposed to seeing its demise happening, how you know, cities transform crises into opportunities and how this all, you know, I mean, the momentum that's coming out of this pandemic is really about transforming our, propelling our cities forward in terms of becoming much more people-centered, people-centric places. This is no longer about the car. It is about people. It's about public space. It's about bringing people together. And it's about also responding to the major crises of our times, be they a pandemic, be they uh, climate change, uh, or uh, the structural inequalities uh, that we are seeing in cities. So thank you all for a very, very inspiring uh, panel. Could have gone much, much longer. Thank you, Freetown, Tirana, New York City, Medellin. Thank you, Manja, Anuela, Santiago, Penny. Thank you, Junaid, for joining us. Thank you for explaining for uh, the World Bank staff what it is that they can do in order to uh, raise uh, their level, both in terms of resilience and urban development. Thank you all. Have a great day and bye.